Good morning and welcome to the fourth and final day of Corporate Council on Africa's Leaders Forum on resilient US-Africa business engagement to drive post-COVID-19 recovery. I'm Flori Lazier, President and CEO of Corporate Council on Africa, the leading US business association focused solely on connecting business interests in Africa. Thank you for joining us today. I want to start by thanking their excellencies, President Kenyatta of Kenya and President Akufo Adu of Ghana for accepting our invitation to participate in today's panel and session. It's a real honor to have you both. I'm also deeply thankful to the sponsors and media partners of this Leaders Forum. They are AcroBridge, AfroTourism, Caterpillar, City, Covington and Burling, Creative Associates, Development Finance International, Flutterwave, General Electric, Lockheed Martin, Procter and Gamble, Rabin Martin, and Visa. And our media partners are All Africa. APO Group and Jeune Afrique. Your support of this forum during these unprecedented times shows how committed you are to CCA and to strengthening and advancing US Africa trade and investment. Now I'm delighted that Demetrius Morantis, Senior Vice President, Global Government Engagement for Visa has agreed to offer welcome remarks to kick off this session. Demetrius has tremendous trade experience as a prior acting US trade representative, deputy USTR, and associate general counsel of USTR. And I was honored to serve under him while he was there at USTR. He also served as chief international trade counsel for the Senate Finance Committee and held several private sector positions. He joined Visa in 2015, and Demetrius is a board member of CCA and also a friend of mine. Demetrius, thank you for starting us off today. Over to you. Thank you so much, Flori, um, for that wonderful introduction. And welcome everybody to the fourth and final day of the Corporate Council on Africa Leaders Forum. My name is Demetrius Morantis, and as Flory mentioned, I lead Visa's global government engagement work and our partnerships with governments in the 200 plus countries and territories in which Visa operates. Thank you so much to Flory and CCA for bringing us together and inviting me to begin today's session on a topic that is near and dear to my heart, trade in Africa. First, I hope everyone is healthy and okay. This pandemic has been deeply destructive for families, economies, and businesses, and is challenging us to think and work differently. This virtual forum is a perfect example. From here in Washington, DC, I am now interacting with government and private sector leaders from San Francisco to Port Louis, and in cities and time zones in between all. It's incredible. And frankly, it's a format we may not have thought feasible at the beginning of 2020. Thank you to Flory and to CCA for making this possible. The past three days have given me new optimism about the US-Africa partnership in times of crisis. In Africa, this new normal has accelerated the pace of digitization in all aspects of life, how we communicate, how we work, and how we spend money. In the payment sector in particular, one clear trend that we see is the rapid advance of e-commerce. In April alone, we saw an 18% increase in the volume of e-commerce globally. In Kenya, 71% of surveyed consumers are ordering groceries online for the first time. In South Africa, e-commerce grew 28% between April and May as in-person spending declined. These consumer preferences and behaviors are here to stay. 
And for small businesses, that means they need to get online to stay relevant, resilient, and participate in the recovery that will come. As the world's leader in digital payments, Visa embraces our responsibility to support Africa's digital readiness and economic recovery. We're doing this in three ways. First, we're partnering with governments across Africa to digitize payments, such as salaries and disbursements in countries ranging from Cote d'Ivoire to South Africa. Second, we're focusing on bringing Africa's micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises into the digital economy. Just this week, Visa announced our commitment to help 50 million small businesses globally to become digitally enabled in the next three years. And that follows on the Visa Foundation's $200 million commitment to help micro and small businesses, particularly those that are women-owned, recover. Third, we are enabling innovation in payments by working with fintechs, telcos, and mobile money providers across Africa to reach more consumers and small businesses. For example, we are enabling cross-border remittances with the Pan-African FinTech MFS Africa. We are also introducing low-cost QR code acceptance for merchants with Ghana's Express Pay. And with Kenya's Safaricom, we are enabling M-Pesa users to engage in e-commerce across borders. We're passionate about these opportunities in Africa and the crisis has crystallized their relevance and the role of digital in all aspects of our lives, our work and trade. As the world recovers, securing the ability of micro and small businesses to get online and engage in e-commerce is more important than ever. Digital trade rules can help. African leaders have already risen to the task of creating new rules for trade before the crisis. I commend His Excellency President Kenyatta for his leadership in initiating negotiations for a Kenya-US free trade agreement. I also congratulate His Excellency President Akufoadu of Ghana on Ghana's successful bid to host the Secretariat of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. As leaders in both trade and payments, Kenya and Ghana have a unique role in shaping the future of digital trade in Africa and beyond. These leaders know that high quality trade agreements that provide a level playing field, support interoperability, encourage technology neutrality, and allow data to flow across borders will encourage the development of competitive digital ecosystems that spur innovation, attract investment, and create jobs. These conditions will accelerate getting small businesses online and will give Africa's vibrant startups and entrepreneurs access to technology and services that support their growth, innovation, and ability to scale across borders. With that, it is my great pleasure to turn to my friend, Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield, former Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs, former US Ambassador to Liberia, and holder of so many diplomatic posts across the world. Ambassador Thomas Greenfield will lead us in an insightful and dynamic discussion with His Excellencies. Thank you. Thank you, Demetrius. And let me, let me start by thanking uh, Flory and the CCA team for putting on this amazing program over the past week. I know many of you have participated throughout the week and you will agree it's been extraordinary. I now have the distinct pleasure and honor to welcome and introduce His Excellencies, President Kenyatta of Kenya and President Akufo-Addo of Ghana. Your Excellencies, it's wonderful to see you again on this very new medium that we have all grown used to over the past three months. And let me just start by welcoming you to the CCA Leaders Forum. We look forward to hearing your views on resilient US Africa business engagement post COVID-19 recovery. And while neither of these two presidents need an introduction to this audience, I still have to share some brief highlights on both of them before I call on them to speak. So I'll start with President Kenyatta. Good morning, Mr. President. 
President Kenyatta is the fourth and the current president of Kenya. He has been in office since April of 2013, and he's had a long and outstanding career in politics, having served in a variety of positions in previous governments. He served as a member of parliament for Gatandu South constituency beginning in 2002. He was appointed deputy prime minister and minister of trade in April of 2008. And in that same year, he was transferred to the treasury as deputy prime minister and minister of finance as part of the Grand Coalition Cabinet, where he served until January of 2012. President Kenyatta is the first son of founding President Yomo Kenyatta. He was born at the dawn of Kenya's independence and he carries his name Uhuru, which means freedom. President Kenyatta attended uh, Amherst College in Massachusetts where he graduated with a bachelor's degree in politics and economics. Now for President Akufo-Addo. His Excellency Nana Addo uh, Denko Akufo-Addo was sworn in uh, on January 7, 2017 as the fifth president of Ghana's fourth republic. I had the honor of attending that inauguration. He has been a prominent champion of human rights, rule of law, justice, freedom, and democracy in Ghana for his entire adult life. As a lawyer, he undertook many of the most important constitutional cases of the modern era in Ghana, which protected the independence of the judiciary, the rights of citizens to demonstrate without police permit, and the right of equal access of all political parties to the state-owned media. President Akufo Addo has held numerous positions and played an active role in the public life of Ghana. He was a three-term MP from 1997 to 2008. He served as Attorney General and Minister of Justice from 2001 to 2003, and Minister of Foreign Affairs from April of 2003 to July of 2007. Now may I turn the floor over to His Excellency, President Kenyatta. We're not hearing President Kenyatta. I'm not sure if it's still on mute. Still not hearing. So President Kenyatta, while we're waiting on uh, your uh, mute to go live, I think it might be uh, in um, concern over time. I will turn to uh, President Akufo Addo and we'll come back to you if that's okay with you. Thank you. President Akufo Addo. So um, thank you very much. Um, I thank the president of the Corporate Council on Africa, Florilisa and her executives for organizing this important leaders forum and for the extent, invitation extended to me to deliver these brief remarks. Let me say a big hello to one of the leading voices on our continent, His Excellency Uhuru Kenyatta, president of the Republic of Kenya. Habari Uhuru. And I'm, particularly, <laughs> and I'm particularly happy to see my good friend, Assistant Secretary of State Linda Thomas Grenfell again, looking so hale and hearty. We all agree that this novel disease, COVID-19, has thrust the whole world into unknown and uncharted territory. And we're having to learn as we go along. That is why we have adopted a whole of Ghana approach and put in place measures to contain the spread of COVID-19 virus. Since the 11th of March, I've been regularly addressing the country on the efforts government has made to mitigate the impact of the pandemic. We've talked some modest successes with our country thus far, recording some 15,473 confirmed cases with 11,431 recoveries 
representing some 74% of positives. This means that currently we have 3,947 active cases, having conducted one of the highest number of tests on the continent, with 30 persons severely and critically ill and 95 sad deaths, constituting 0.6% of positives, one of the lowest death rates in the world. While ensuring that we protect the lives of our people, we're also having to ensure that we lift, limit the devastating impact of the virus on our economy. The impact on the Ghanaian economy, and indeed on other African countries, has come in two forms, namely the effects of the global economic slowdown and the effects of the decline in domestic productive activities, in trade, investments, agriculture, and the operations of the financial sector. In response to the pandemic, I mandated initially the creation of the 250 million United States dollars Corona's alleviation program we call CAP to support households and micro, small and medium sized businesses. Its intent was to help mobile, minimize job losses and stimulate economic revitalization by mobilizing private and public sector finances to expand industrial output for domestic consumption and exports. Out of this amount, 42 million United States dollars were used to provide food for the vulnerable and free water for all Ghanaians for three months, that is in the month of April, May, and June. 555 million United States dollars were used to motivate, motivate our health workers and 100 million United States dollars was provided in assistance to support micro, small, and medium scale businesses. Further, government has absorbed electricity bills for 1 million active lifeline customers. These are the poorest category of customers and granted a 50% subsidy on electric city bills of all other customers, again, for the months of April, May, and June. In total, the relief on electricity is some $200 million. Government has also secured a $1 billion United States dollar rapid credit facility from the IMF without any precondition to help close the financing gap that has been created by the pan pandemic through shortfalls in revenues and unbudgeted additional expenditure. A $500 and 20 million United States dollar credit and stimulus package from the commercial banks made with the support of the central bank, the Bank of Ghana, has been instituted also to revitalize industries, especially in the pharmaceutical, hospitality, services, and manufacturing sectors. Through efforts from the ministers for finance of Ghana and South Africa, who are the co-chairs of the Committee of African Finance Ministers, a nine-month debt standstill from the World Bank has been negotiated for all qualifying members of the IDA, totaling some 44 billion United States dollars for the countries of Africa. In the case of Ghana, this results in a freeze in principal and interest payments for the year, amounting to some 500 million United States dollars. This has created greater fiscal space to enhance the resilience of the Ghanaian economy. In all, government has established an 18 billion United States dollar Ghana COVID alleviation and revitalization of enterprises program, which we call Ghana Cares, whose aim over the next three years is to stabilize, revitalize, and transform our national economy through the improvement of the country's business climate and support for the private sector. We've seized the opportunity that has emerged from this pandemic to enhance the capacity of our domestic private sector to produce many of our essential products with the pharmaceutical and garment sectors in the lead. Government has pr procured some 14, billion, 14 million United States worth of personal uh, protective equipment such as face masks and medical scrubs, head covers, hospital gowns, 
from domestic government and textile manufacturing companies for frontline health workers and for students going back to school to prepare and sit for their final exams. It is vital that we maintain the momentum towards the implementation of the African continental free trade area and mainstream COVID-19 strategies, international uh, plans, given the potential for the AFCFTA to become the game changer for Africa's economic transformation. More than ever, regional and continental in integration remain the imperatives of our time to boost our production, strengthen our market, and promote our self-reliance. And in doing so, we're looking very much to strengthening US and uh, Africa trade relations so that these goals, the enhancement of our productive capacity, strengthening our, the African market, promoting our self-reliance can be the mutual objective of this enhanced trade relations between our two countries, our two continents. There's so much that can be done, both from our end and from the American end, that can promote a stronger economic and trade relation between Africa and the, the United States. And all of it within the context of an enhanced relationship. We're looking very much forward to the goals of the, the new United States Development Finance Corporation as fitting in and being in sync with our own national and continental objectives. The AFCFTA, we believe, is going to provide a great opportunity for American businesses to invest in the greater market that this uh, trade area is going, will represent for the world. We're looking forward very much to the exchange, which will enable American technology and investment and know-how to invest in greater and greater quantities within the American market. I thank you very much for the opportunity to make this contribution to this important leaders forum. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Now may I turn the floor over to President Kenyatta. Are we working on it? We look forward to hearing you, Mr. President. Mr. President, <clears throat> I know you have some very important things to say and that technology is uh, standing in the way of us, uh, of us hearing what, uh, what you have to, to say right now. So um, what I will do uh, at the moment uh, is uh, start the, the uh, discussion with, um, uh, with President Akufoado. Uh, unless I get a message that uh, the mic is going to be open up in, in a few minutes. A few seconds. Not. Nah. Yes, Mr. President, you're still muted. <clears throat> so while we're waiting on President uh, Kenyatta, uh, thank you again, uh, President Akufalado, for for your uh, remarks. Um, what I would like to start with is to ask your um, views on how uh, you see COVID-19 um, impacting uh, the continent. And you talked about the uh, imperative to continue with the continental free, uh, the implementation of the continental free trade area, which is going to be um, in the Secretariat, which is going to be in Ghana. 
do you see or foresee any possibilities that this might be delayed? Well, um, already, I mean, we, we know the impacts of the COVID across of, uh, on all our economies. I think it's, it's, uh, what's the impact on us is, is, uh, is as much as we've seen the impact elsewhere. Um, and already the, the AU has taken the decision to delay the actual operationalization of the, of, of the trade area to uh, 2021. July. Originally, it was meant to begin this very month of, well, next month, as it were, beginning of July. But it's now been taken six months further down the road to uh, January of 2021. And hopefully, we will all have had a, a more structured way to, to keep this uh, uh, COVID at bay. The Secretariat is in Accra. There's no impact on it. In fact, we have done everything that is required for us on our part to to get the Secretariat moving. And we're just waiting for the situation to become clearer for it to be going. But it is going to be a major, a major development. And I think it's a development that American businesses and enterprises should interest themselves in strongly because we're going to have a huge market. We're talking about uh, a market of what, 1.3 million people with a, a, com a collective uh, GDP of some two trillion. Uh, American uh, dollars, and with tremendous opportunities for for investment in virtually the whole range of economic activity that one can think of, whether it is in manufacturing or in agriculture, investment in technology, in the in the, the digitalization, are going to be uh, areas which provide a lot of opportunity for. Uh, American businesses. And we're looking forward very much to seeing how we can develop. Obviously, there are many things that are going to have to change in the, in the, in the COVID environment um, in terms of uh, flows. And we, for instance, have now committed ourselves to doing whatever we can to strengthen our own domestic productive capacity. We found ourselves in a big bind when uh, the global supply chains were disrupted, seeing to what extent we were so dependent on foreign imports to, keep, to do even some of the most basic things that an economy has to do. All these are lessons for us, and we are going to promote much greater domestic industrial production and, and by, by enhancing and supporting our own local businesses. We're gonna put also much greater emphasis on ensuring food security. Once again, as a result of the, the lessons we have learned uh, out of this pandemic. And in, and in doing so, uh, we're going to continue to welcome foreign investment, foreign private investment in, across board in various sectors of our economy. So we see a lot of opportunity for increased and enhanced US-Africa trade Thank you, Mr. President. I, I'm hoping that we were going to have the opportunity to listen to President Kenyatta. I think and we have finally, it. Finally, are we getting the opportunity? I are think we, we have it. Hugging this world. Can you hear me this time, Linda? I can hear you loud and clear, sir. Welcome. Thank you, and my sincere apologies for uh, everything that's going on. I apologize for that. Well, a good morning to all of you, and uh, let me just say once again, it's... Uh, Wonderful to join you this morning and to my brother Nana. It's a good afternoon, I believe, same as we are here, just a couple of hours behind us. And good morning to everybody who's out in uh, the States. And let's say that we appreciate the lead that the Corporate Council on Africa has taken in trying to promote business and investment relations between the United States and Africa since it was first established in uh, 1993. I take the opportunity also to applaud the council for seizing this moment, a critical moment when all of us are facing very severe challenges. And to use the current crisis as an opportunity to recalibrate and to reinvigorate the US-Africa business engagement. 
In particular, I appreciate the spirit of understanding and the spirit that underpins this forum, which is to conduct in a manner that ensures our respective countries and economies emerge out of this crisis more strong and more resilient. And there's no doubt that the unprecedented COVID-19 crisis has hit all our countries hard, but it has revealed our world's vulnerabilities, but also our inequalities. The effect of the pandemic has overwhelmed the health systems globally and exasperated unemployment, kept students out of schools, disrupted global value chains and supply chains, and precipitated a huge looming debt crisis in many developing countries across the world. In Kenya, we have had relatively few COVID-19 cases, just over 5,000 or so positive cases with 130 fatalities. And this occurred in the first 100 days since the confirmation of the first case. The numbers could have been higher, but we moved swiftly to institute robust containment measures. We closed our borders, closed our schools, and prohibited large gatherings we increased testing, contact tracing, quarantine measures, in addition to intensifying social distance and other hygiene protocol requirements. Containment measures have indeed saved lives. However, they have too led to economic contraction, loss of jobs and livelihoods, especially in the informal sector, as well as the service sector in particular tourism and our hotel industry. My government had to move fast to put in place measures to cushion the most vulnerable members of our society, and we extended similar measures to the business sector. But the crisis has also brought to the fore our resilience and capacity as a global community, but also as individual countries. Interestingly and indeed encouraging, our emerging manufacturing sector has demonstrated unprecedented resourcefulness. The sector is producing currently in Kenya personal protective equipment and is making major breakthroughs in manufacturing medical equipment, including ventilators. We have also harnessed digital technologies to roll out e-learning for schools, provide digital payments for vulnerable individuals, and to convey timely health public information to our citizens. At a continental level, under the umbrella of the African Union, we are coordinating our continental efforts to combat COVID-19, including the rollout of the African medical supply platform, and a concerted global effort has led to an agreement on debt service moratorium to suppress, and su sorry, to support rather, debt stressed uh, countries, which is virtually all of us. So therefore, to jumpstart our economies, we need to put investment and trade at the front and center of our recovery strategies. Through duty-free and quota-free preferential market accesses under the Africa Growth and Opportunity Act, Kenya and other African countries have registered significant growth in their exports. However, to reverse the COVID-related economic decline, we need massive injection of investment capital into our economies and a quantum increase in our exports as well. Indeed, as we're all aware, the Agora arrangement is set to expire in 2025. And Kenya is particularly keen to negotiate a free trade agreement with the United States that is based on international trade law and the WTO general principles, and one that promotes preferential and mutually beneficial trade, investment, and economic relations. We seek to conclude an FTA that protects emerging industrial and agricultural sectors in Kenya, and one that leads to the creation of decent jobs and sustainable livelihoods for our people. And we expect that the FTA will lead also to an increase in foreign direct investment into Kenya, but also into the rest of Africa, which in turn catalyze 
linkages in supply value chains across the entire African region. Linda, let me conclude by urging all of us, and in this I support the sentiments of my brother, Nana, for us to seize this COVID-19 crisis to collaborate more closely, not just to fight the pandemic, but also to recover together and to generate new trade, investment, and economic opportunities between Africa and the United States. And all of this based on shared prosperity for our respective countries. So as opening remarks, Linda, that's what I have to say. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity to join you all this morning and afternoon. Good, thank you so much, Mr. President. I'm so happy that technology finally worked for, uh, for us because we really wanted to hear uh, what you had to say. So let me, I, I won't pose the exact same question to you that I uh, posed to uh, President Akufuado on the impact of COVID because I think you addressed that in your remarks. But from the US perspective, I think we would all be interested in whether you see that there will be any changes in the approach to and the relevance of uh, Kenya uh, US free trade uh, agreement discussions. Are those moving forward? Uh, how have they been impacted by, uh, by this crisis? Despite the fact that we have had uh, this uh, uh, health pandemic, we have continued to engage through uh, various uh, 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 outlets. Our ambassador in Washington himself has been uh, aggressively engaged in this process. So I believe we're still on schedule to start our negotiations, which are scheduled to start in July 7th. And that's an important date because you know, we did agree, and uh, for us, the Africa uh, free trade area is something that is very important to us. Ghana, Kenya uh, were among the leading countries that pushed for this Africa free trade arrangement. And uh, under that arrangement, what we did agree is that uh, uh, all negotiations would come into play as soon as the Africa free trade uh, agreement came into effect. So that's July, the first week of July, July 7th in particular. And uh, our negotiations with the United States are scheduled to start on the very same day. So I am myself quite confident all the preliminaries have gone well. And I do believe, uh, as I have always stated, that if we are successful in these negotiations, Kenya then can act as a sort of the... Uh, um, uh, the lead or the guide, so that many other African countries can also follow a suit. So we will be the guinea pig, and I am certain that uh, we, we will be able, together with our friends in the United States, to reach uh, an agreement that would encourage all our brothers and sisters on the continent to sort of follow suit and to join in, so that ultimately we can achieve our, our, our key objective, which is to increase the volume of trade and investment between the African continent and the United States of America. And I believe that uh, everything so far is, 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 is actually on course, and we are all very keen and excited, and our teams are very keen and excited, raring to go, and we look forward to us being able to uh, kick off these uh, negotiations. Thank you, Mr. President. President Akufo-Addo. Can I ask, and I will come back to you with the same question, uh, President Kenyatta, what role do you see uh, the US and Africa private sector playing in, um, in the post COVID uh, recovery? And are there sectors that you think will be more important for the private sector uh, moving forward? President Akufuado. I think one important, um development that the private sector in America can pay particular attention to is what's well, something that uh, President uh, Kenyatta has alluded to in his, in his remarks, and that is the future of the Africa growth and opportunities, uh, uh, the AGOA legislation. It's due to come to an end in 2024. 
I think it's a good time for us to pause to see whether or not the uh, efforts should be made to extend it, because clearly it has been beneficial. It has permitted many African enterprises to take advantage in, of, of its terms to enter the United States market. And um, as far as I'm concerned, there's every reason why we should look at the possibility of extending it. And to that extent, we would want the support of the private sector in the United States to help us in that exercise of having the extension. But then, when you're talking about energy, you're talking about manufacturing, you're talking about digitization, these are all areas of economic activity in which America has a serious advantage in terms of uh, the, the technology and the know-how. I would believe that these are, uh, are areas where American technology can be profitably employed on the continent. And the, especially within the context of this larger market that the AFCFTA, the African Free Trade Area, is going to present. So opportunities are there. The Development Finance Corporation, which is now coming to being, has yet to really take off. We need to work together in private sectors of both uh, to see to what extent access to the new capital that is involved there can be facilitated. And generally, the mobilization of funds in America, of investment funds in America for, for, for investment in our economies is something that would be very worthwhile. You know, we keep on making, uh, I don't know whether it's a complaint, but a statement that somehow or other uh, we don't get the same in, in involvement. This is why the effort that is being made by the Kenyan leader on the trade relate, uh, trade agreement between Kenya and the United States is something very, very, very significant and will be very significant for all of us. The emphasis, the, the, the emphasis of America on exploring economic opportunities on the continent has not been perhaps as intense as some of us would have wished. I think that the opportunity is now there for us to work together towards that. Good. Thank you, Mr. President. President Kenyatta. Well, I, 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 I agree with uh, what my, my brother has also just said, but I just want to add and say that uh, I also believe that uh, the post-crisis also has created new opportunities in the health sector, for example. And this is uh, an area I believe that uh, private sector in the United States of America could really have a, a, a big head start over, over many other African countries, given the, the, the uh, um, 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 scale, you know, with companies like GE and so many others who, who, who this is a great opportunity for them to invest in the African continent because, as we have seen, small, the kind of interruptions that we have had in supply chain uh, has made it very difficult for us to, to, to be able to move equipment, get drugs and et cetera, because of the disruptions caused by this COVID. So I think one of the opportunities is to sort of expand our supply chains and establish new bases in different parts of the world to be able to ease um, any possibility of future uh, 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 problems in, in supply chain. I believe that there is great opportunity, for example, in information technology, where again, Kenya, Africa largely is a very young country, very young continent, great potential of working with our young people in information technology. We have a good number of companies that are already now based in Nairobi, working with the young people, coming up with new different apps and uh, et cetera that are pertinent, not only to our continent, but also globally. And those are again our areas where we can uh, partner and work closely together. That on top of agriculture and the fields of uh, uh, um, uh, construction and bridge building, these are all opportunities, I believe, for, for, for American private sector where they can base themselves here, they can base themselves on this continent. I have always said this is a continent that requires everything from toothbrushes to machine tooling and, 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 and a continent with over a billion uh, people. And especially when we look at this Africa free trade arrangement that is coming into play, I see huge opportunities for American private sector to set themselves up here, 
service not only the African continent, but also service other parts of the world in a very, very cost-effective uh, uh, manner, while at the same time helping and working together with us to get these young people employed, to get these young people engaged, and to get these young people the kind of skills that they will require in this increasingly globalized world. So there is a huge potential, I believe, for and a huge role for the uh, uh, private sector of America. This is something during my many visits to, 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 to your headquarters, I have always reiterated again and again and again that this is the opportune time to invest, to trade, to partner with Africa. This is the best time in the world. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, I've been informed that we have um, uh, run out of time, but I wonder if uh, you might want to uh, make a few closing remarks. I got a lot of questions from nearly 300 uh, members of the audience. We have not opened it up for the audience, but just uh, one that was related to Kenya was when was Kenya Airlines going to uh, resume and noting that uh, that uh, Kenya uh, uh, that Kenya is an important uh, marketplace. I also want to uh, take the opportunity to uh, thank uh, President Akufo-Addo. I got a message that he had to run uh, because uh, we did go out of time. So I will turn it to you to make final uh, comments and then I'll turn it back over to our host. Thank you very much, Linda, and uh, mine, first and foremost, just to answer the, uh, the, 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 the question on KQ, we are going to be starting uh, domestic flights, um, and this is what we're going to use as our trial over the, uh, let's say, next couple of days, because we are opening up the, the lockdown that we have had between inter-county lockdown. And ultimately, I think that's what's going to set the pace for uh, a getting a date for us to open up now once again to international flights. We have seen that if you don't take the necessary precautions, if you don't put in place the necessary measures, uh, opening up too quickly also has its downside, as we have seen in different parts of the world. So we are very eager to open up, but at the same time, we're also eager to make sure that we all stay safe, that we all stay uh, uh, healthy and we save lives. So it's that balancing, and um, we are doing everything that we can to make sure we're back in the skies. I think uh, in closing remarks is just to say that I can't emphasize enough the, 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 the importance I attach to uh, um, this month of July when we are kicking off these discussions. I have always said that the United States of America, in the early stages of our countries or the dawn of independence, the United States was heavily involved, participated, helped very many um, um, liberation movements. Thurgood Marshall, who helped us draft our first constitution, um, pushing and uh, the, the United Kingdom to end empire. And you were heavily involved in Africa. A lot of the companies that still exist today started their business on this continent in the early 60s. But for one reason or another, that appetite was lost. Yes, we did go through a very difficult period in the 80s and the 90s where there were governance issues and so many other things. But we have turned that corner. And I think, Linda, you can bear witness that the majority of Africa has turned that corner. And we are now operating in a completely different environment. We are focused on private sector. We are getting more and more business-friendly uh, um, rules and laws and regulations, understanding that uh, it is the private sector that drives business. It's the private sector that's going to help us create jobs. So let's, we can't forget the past, but let's not live in that past. Let us work together to create a new shared future that is based on the values and principles that we share and have shared from the time of our independence. Welcome and let's do business. Let's get this ball rolling.
Thank you, Your Excellency. And uh, thank you to President uh, Akudo, uh, Akufoado, who has already departed. I know that we're all sending you a virtual hand of applause uh, from uh, all over the world. And uh, I look forward to continuing to work with you and to work with your team on the future of Kenya, Africa, and the United States. I now turn the floor over to our leader, Flori Lazare, the head of CCA, to chair the next panel. Well, thank you so much, Linda. And, and thank you, Your Excellencies, President Kenyatta and President Akufa Adu. We know he had to leave, but thank you so much, President Kenyatta, for being here, President Akufa Adu, for your very valuable insights and perspectives. So before I invite uh, the panelists uh, to join the second part of our session, I just want to go over some housekeeping rules for questions. Please use the Zoom chat function to send us your questions. Uh, we look forward to asking them if there's enough time. We know that uh, we have a top level panel and our discussion will be very intense, but we will try to take questions if we can. Uh, those who send in questions, please make sure that you provide your name and your affiliation. So I'd like to start by inviting our distinguished panelists uh, to join me, Wamkele Mene, the Secretary General of the African Continental Free Trade Area Secretariat, Tewold Gebra Mariam, the Group CEO of Ethiopian Airlines, Vilo Triska, the Senior Vice President and General Manager of Procter & Gamble Southern Africa, and Jeff Hardy, the Government Affairs Director for Asia Pacific, Africa, and the Middle East for Caterpillar. Taken together, these members of this panel have a wealth of Africa trade and investment experience. Welcome to all of you. So Wamkele, let me start with uh, you. Uh, first uh, question to you. How will COVID-19 impact the AFCFTA, the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, not just in terms of uh, shifted timelines, but maybe in priorities and, and the rollout of the AFCFTA? Uh, welcome, Juan Kelly. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Flori. Thank you so much to you and CCA for inviting me and for over the years being a very, very good partner to Africa. I, I appreciate this invitation. Um, I think as the president said, President Akufu Adu, as he said, there is a timeline issue of uh, six months, uh, the shift in um, the implementation or rather in the trading date. But in terms of priorities, what COVID-19 has underscored is that Africa requires to accelerate industrial development and mm -hmm. to accelerate the establishment of um, regional value chains and to ensure that Africa is able to, um, to move up on the, um, on the global value chains and to ensure that Africa's productive capacity is significantly enhanced. I think the fact that we see um, a, a, a crisis in terms of uh, the equipment that we need, the, 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 the tools that we need to fight the pandemic, the personal protection equipment, the ventilators that we as Africans have had to import them from outside and we've had to battle this um, uh, 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 and have to engage in this battle for a fight to have these uh, products uh, uh, imported into Africa because of the, the, the competition for these goods in the global market. So this underscores the point for Africa to accelerate um, industrialization and that creates an opportunity as President Kenyatta was saying, it creates an opportunity for investment. It creates an opportunity for uh, investors in the US to invest in value chains in Africa, in productive uh, manufacturing in Africa, in capital equipment in Africa, in services, um, to invest in services, in financial services in Africa, which we know is the backbone of, um, of Africa's manufacturing. And so I think we, we, we now have 
uh, a new focus, and this new focus is acceleration of Africa's industrial development. Whether you are talking about trade in goods or trade in services, we have got to make sure that we accelerate um, our industrial development. Thank you, Wankele. Uh, and just a quick question, just to clarify, when is the date now for actually um, uh, implementing the AFCFTA? I think it was going to be July 1 of this year. Can you help us uh, in understanding what will now actually happen? Well, we have, um, we, we, we recommend that 1st of July is not practical, it's not possible. Um, we heard uh, from the heads of states, they set out the challenges that are related to COVID-19. Out of 55 countries in Africa, 42 are under a, a full or partial lockdown. Mm. Borders are closed except for transit of critical goods. Um, and so under these conditions, it's not possible when governments are focused on fighting the, the pandemic, which in my view is, is quite sensible and quite responsible, saving African lives is the priority. When governments are focused on that, we need to give them the space uh, to defeat the pandemic. What we recommended as a secretariat, working with uh, our partners and the ambassadors here in, in Ethiopia, is that um, heads of states should uh, uh, postpone the uh, implementation, the trading date rather, from the 1st of July to the soonest possible date. We mm -hmm. proposed to our heads of states, the 1st of January, 2020. We hope that the heads of states will accept that recommendation. It gives us time to defeat the pandemic. It, it gives us time for the health expertise uh, to put in place the measures that we need for travel to happen, for commerce uh, to restart. Uh, and most importantly, it gives us time as um, a, a trade and as a secretariat and trade professionals to get back to the drawing board, mm. to resume our work and to redouble our efforts. Because I think as you heard the two presidents saying, um, the stimulus package for Africa is implementation of this agreement. We don't have $3 trillion. We don't have $60 billion for an airline industry. What we do have is the potential for Africa to boost intra-Africa trade through mm -hmm. this agreement and to significantly, to significantly enhance um, the potential for recovery year on year post uh, COVID-19 through implementation of this agreement. Thank you very much, Wam Kelly. And, and I, I just wanna make sure it's uh, January 1 of 2021 that we're hoping this will happen. Now, let me turn to um, Mr. Uh, Gebra Mariam uh, CEO, Group CEO of Ethiopian Airlines. And sir, we're delighted to have you here. I just have to tell you that my very last trip to um, the continent, I came, I, I went to uh, Addis uh, and then to Nairobi in February and I was on Ethiopian Airlines. And so uh, I was really pleased that you were still flying, that I could get into the continent and actually still get back home. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Now, what has been the impact, sir, of COVID-19 on trade and tourism in Africa, and particularly on the future of African aviation? Um, uh, thank you, Flori, uh, President of CCA, um, uh, uh, Excellency Heads of States, Excellency Ministers, Excellency the U.S., uh, Acting Secretary of State, Excellency Ambassadors, uh, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to join you this morning and good morning to everybody. Um, thank you, Flori, for uh, uh, traveling with us in February. And by the way, we are still flying. Uh, we uh -huh. have not suspended flights. So it's, it's a good uh, memory and uh, uh, we can not, we can also fly you now wherever you want. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so thank you for inviting me and uh, thank you also for arranging this forum in this uh, global pandemic and uh, global crisis. It is uh, highly appreciated. Uh, well, you know, COVID-19 has devastated the world and uh, of course, Africa included. Um, the 
And uh, the tourism and uh, aviation industry is the most affected, as you can imagine. People are not moving. Uh, when more than one third of uh, the global population is uh, under lockdown, uh, more than 1.5 billion students are uh, sitting at home. They are not uh, uh, going to school. So, um, I mean, it goes without, uh, it, it doesn't need explanation that this has really crippled the entire world. And when it comes to Africa, so the human cost is, thanks to God, is not as bad as in the rest of the world. Uh, the, the total confirmed cases are also on, on the lower side in the entire continent of Africa. But in, uh, in uh, trying to manage the crisis and in trying to control the spread of the virus, uh, the entire continent is almost on lockdown. That means entire economies are affected, uh, no tourism industry to speak of, and uh, no airline is flying. Uh, so it is really, really bad. And, uh, uh, but uh, let me take this opportunity. I think uh, there are a lot of lessons that we need as Africans, we need to learn. And, uh, um, my, my friend and my colleague, Mr. His Excellency, Mr. Wamkele will be uh, um, um, the one to join me that, you know, the absence of uh, vibrant trade relations within and among Africa, African countries and African people uh, has made us very, very vulnerable. Um, I think it stands around 16%. Uh, I mean, 16% of African trade is within itself and the rest is with the rest of the world. And when you compare that with the European Union, it's 60, 60, 60 versus 16. Mm. While, while the African Union is as old as the European Union. So we should have a, a achieved a lot. And I think the continental free trade uh, agreement is going to help. Of course, uh, I heard that because of the COVID, it's going to be delayed, but uh, we have been very vulnerable and COVID-19 has witnessed this and we learn a lot. Uh, Ethiopia exports, I always say this analogy, Ethiopia exports and Kenya export uh, flour to Europe and most of uh, African countries, West African countries import that the same flour to West Africa. So this shows how badly we are uh, disconnected in terms of trade, investment, and tourism and our service. And that has held, ha uh, affected us very, very much. So, uh, well, um, but uh, I, I would like to take this opportunity also to inform uh, participants that Africa is still well connected. Uh, with good airlines like Ethiopian Airlines, Kenya Airways, South African Airways, Egypt Air, and so on. Uh, although we lack a lot of uh, inter-Africa connectivity, but when we see Africa with the rest of the world, it is well connected uh, yeah. by, uh, by some African countries, but uh, airlines, but also by non-African uh, um, airlines. So the African aviation industry is highly affected. But before the COVID-19, it was already sick. And uh, COVID-19 al uh, already made it uh, worse. Otherwise, uh, we were in a very bad shape as an industry. Uh, so we, we learned a lot. And uh, as far as Ethiopian Airlines is concerned, uh, we have not stopped flights. We are still flying to almost all destinations in Europe. Uh, we are still flying to New York, Washington, and Chicago, Toronto, Brazil, uh, and uh, almost all African countries. Uh, the only thing uh, that we are not doing right now is we are not carrying as many passengers as we used to, but mm -hmm. we are carrying cargo to uh, most of the uh, uh, destinations. Uh, and we have been a very good support, logistical support to, to, to uh, I'll, uh, I'll explain that later. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I think African economies are highly affected, uh, mainly because of the lockdown. Uh, export is very, very weak, almost non-existent, uh, not only because of the uh, uh, demand,
but also because of the supply, because the production capacity is significantly diminished. People are locked down at home. Uh, tourism is dead. And um, uh, commodity prices, that is mm -hmm. the, the, the yes. other uh, impact that uh, commodity prices have gone down, and particularly oil. So the oil exporting countries are, again, uh, double affected. So, uh, I mean, this is a very, very uh, tough challenge. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. you you've given us a, a good overview of uh, the impact on businesses and uh, particularly airlines, um, not just Ethiopia, but across the continent. Let me turn now um, uh, to um, uh, Vila Triska of um, Procter & Gamble uh, to get maybe the uh, perspective from a, a, a U.S. company. So, uh, Vila, how, how are U.S. companies in particular uh, like Procter & Gamble adapting to COVID-19 and uh, also preparing strategically uh, for uh, the post-COVID-19 reality? And, and are there any lessons that uh, you can share from a U.S. corporate uh, perspective? Mm -hmm. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Flori, and good afternoon uh, to all of the participants from Africa. Uh, I'm happy to be here. Uh, before I share the learning on uh, on COVID-19, let me go a little bit back and, and share some of the history of, of ENG in Africa. And I'll try to put it in the context. We've been in Africa for a little bit over 60 years. Uh, and over the, over the time, we have built our production capabilities in Morocco, Egypt, Nigeria, and South Africa, uh, and as well as expanded our presence through offices in Kenya, Ethiopia, and Ghana. Now, over the 60 years, we have created over 25,000 direct and indirect jobs in Africa. And then we worked with hundreds of small and medium enterprises in our sustained training and development programs. Now, uh, money-wise, we have invested over $2 billion in capital in Africa only. And we are reviewing investment opportunities regularly. Our last investment was our Femcare production capacity in South Africa which was announced in November last year uh, during President Ramaphosa Investment Conference here in South Africa. And it increased our local production employment, manufacturing employment by 30%. Now, uh, on top of our sort of economical investments, we are also investing socially. Uh, our social programs touch over 50 million children across 17 African countries uh, with our health and hygiene education programs. And I still remember us sitting last year in Mozambique, um, uh, Maputo, talking about the African uh, continental free trade agreement and how great it's going to help the, the countries and economies of the, of the uh, continent. And here we are a year later living in a completely different world. And uh, as all the, all the guests mentioned, uh, you know, the pandemic has completely changed both business and public sector lives. And I think, uh, you know, as a company, we had to, we had to shift gears and adopt. Um, and for us, uh, the, the call which we made as a company was uh, that we will protect our employees first. Okay, that was, that was the first and most important thing. What we've done is actually we took some of the government imposed regulations and, and we went well beyond them. Uh, when it comes to you know, offices, for those people who could work from home, we al allowed them and enabled them to work from home. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we try to comply you know, beyond the regulations with the country's lockdowns. Uh, when it comes to manufacturing, most of our products which we produce in, in African continent are considered to be essential when it comes to health or hygiene. Um, so we scaled the operations to prevent the social distancing in the plants to enable continuous operations. Uh, we ensure transportation of our essential personnel uh, from their homes to, to our plants to ensure that they are not exposed uh, to COVID-19 during the transport. We obviously use compulsory uh, personal protective equipment. Uh, we completely adhere to local or government regulations. And in a lot of cases, we actually go beyond that. Yeah. We've been also, um, you know, adjusting our production production capacities. Uh, yeah. In some of our plants, we started to yeah. produce face masks. 
uh, in our global Gillette operations, uh, instead of making blades and razors, we started to produce uh, face shields, which we are donating to frontline healthcare workers. Uh, and in some of our plants, we actually scale the production of our safeguard hand sanitizers. So, so that was some of the uh, learnings which we had to implement or through the, the crisis and through the pandemic. Now, when it comes to consumers, I think there is a significant shift in consumers' uh, realities. And uh, one of the biggest things which we experienced uh, was changing shopping behavior. Uh, consumers want convenient shopping. And I saw one of the comments uh, on the chat said, please don't kill retail uh, through e-commerce we are not trying to kill the retail. I think the people are choosing convenience and it depends on the retailer, how they want to address that convenience. In a lot of the cases, it's online. People want to online, want to order online. In a lot of the cases is they want to go to the store, okay? But instead of going to two, three different stores, they want to have the choice in one of their stores. Uh, so we had to adjust as a company to all these consumer realities. When it comes to consumer demands, obviously, as you could expect, health and hygiene are number one priorities now. And we see you know, increased demands and also changing behaviors on how, how people use some of the health and hygiene products. And we had to address those. And last one, which I would like to mention is, uh, we call it do it yourself. Uh, and it's not do it yourself in original sense, uh, like building you know, uh, home furniture. But it's uh, you know, a lot of things which were done externally in salons, hairdressers, consumers are moving it and doing, doing those, those habits at home. So again, having the right product um, and available in the market is, is one of those things which are helping us to address the changing consumer, consumer needs. Obviously, we've been working with our online partners uh, to increase our offering and deliver on the changing needs of consumers. And then the last one is working with the governments. Uh, and I'm happy to, to say that we've been working closely with governments to developing the policies which promote health and hygiene uh, as we went through the early stages of the crisis. And, and I must say that uh, it was learning for, for both public and private sector, um, but the crisis pushed us to, to work actually together and, and bring both best out of both uh, as we went through the crisis. So from my side, you know, I can mention technology, you know, a lot of, lot of governments are working with the business partners and asking input online uh, for the new policies which are coming to the place, which governments are implementing. And I find this very, very helpful. And I hope that this will remain a good practice going forward and will help us to implement or accelerate implementation of some of the new policies uh, going forward. Thank you very much, Vila. Um, so let me turn now, that was a good uh, 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 sort of summary of the kinds of things that fast moving consumer goods companies like Procter & Gamble are doing. Let me turn now to Jeff Hardy of Caterpillar where, you know, the issues that affect infrastructure may be a bit different. Um, now, uh, Jeff, many Africans see the potential for global supply chains to shift more to the continent post COVID. Um, how realistic is that? Um, especially given some of the new uh, tendencies that have come up in terms of trade and how can um, U.S. companies like Caterpillar um, play a role in terms of uh, the new uh, value chains, the new global supply chains, and particularly uh, I'd like your thoughts on um, uh, the infrastructure uh, sector and the role that it plays in post-COVID uh, recovery. Well, thank you very much, Flory, for the question. And first, I'd like to just thank you for the invitation to participate in this important panel, such distinguished panelists that I'm joined on the panel with, and I really appreciate the opportunity. This has been a really fascinating three days of discussions here before, uh, with a kickoff of President uh, Rwanda and, and uh, Kagame, and then today joined by two presidents, Kenya, uh, Kenyatta and President Akufo Adu. So it's really been a fabulous discussion. And I do think that there is, uh, there, it's really an exciting time for trade in Africa. I agree that it does present some extraordinary opportunities. So what I'd like to do is address your question by saying why I think it does. 
suggest how to capture the opportunities and provide information on Caterpillar's experience in Africa between the why and the how to put it into context. So first, why? Uh, well, why is there potential for, for global supply chains to shift more to the continent now? We know COVID-19 has impacted many economies in, in Africa and post COVID-19, the drivers are going to continue. And so these include population growth, which we've heard before, 1.2 billion to maybe 2.5 billion by 2050. Urbanization is taking place. Tremendous infrastructure needs really across the continent. And it's not unique to Africa, but infrastructure needs everywhere, but a lot of infrastructure needs in, in Africa. And, and now there is new attention being uh, looked at supply chains. So given the growth and demand and then the new attention to supply chains, Africa does have every opportunity to attract uh, the investment. So what ingredients are missing though to be able to attract this investment? And to put it in context, let me just say that Caterpillar has been in the continent for over 90 years. We appointed our first dealer in Tunisia in 1926. That was in fact our first international dealer. So we've been in the, contact in, the, in the continent for over 90 years. And since then, our products have been involved in really all aspects of infrastructure development, highways, roads, bridges, ports, dams. Uh, we power large buildings in power plants also. We power hospitals. We're developing mineral resources. Uh, we've been involved in marine and rail transportation. So really across the board. And today Caterpillar and our independent dealers have over 15,000 employees across the continent and we're represented in nearly every country. And you know, our independent dealers include Barlow World Equipment, Mantrak, Tractifreak, Manutention um, Afrikan, other, other dealers as well. And we also have Caterpillar subsidiaries, Progress Rail, Solar Turbines, Perkins. So we're very well represented in the African continent. And our customers, or an infrastructure, power, mining, transportation. Um, and what they demand is uptime of the equipment. Everything has mm. to work. Mm. So despite the progress made over the years to the regional economic community agreements and African Union level, it's still a challenge to get our independent dealers throughout the continent, the right parts and components in a timely manner to serve our customers and keep the CAT equipment up and running. So to help address this issue, in 2017, Caterpillar invested in a new state-of-the-art parts distribution facility in, in South Africa, Kempton Park. It's the largest such facility in our industry in Africa. And the distribution center supports over 35,000 active machines and engines in, in Southern Africa. Now, despite this major investment in logistics support for the continent, it can still take more than 20 days to move critical machine and engine components between Southern African countries. And, and this is pre-COVID. So this reduces competitiveness, causes project delays, and of course adds to cost. So now to the how. Uh, it's, it, it is realistic the supply chains can shift to Africa, but to capture the opportunity, it really does depend on the speed and scope of implementing the much discussed African Continental Free Trade Agreement and completing new uh, high standard bilateral regional agreements, such as the US-Kenya uh, free trade agreement that, that uh, is underway. And at the opening of the CCA Leaders Forum, uh, President Kagame, he emphasized the importance of the African, free, uh, African Continental Free Trade Agreement, mm -hmm. and also the need to work together as a continent to drive this growth. Africa has competition um, with large countries, but also with regions that are far more integrated than Africa. So we hope that the, impl the implementation of the Continental Free Trade Agreement, as well as the WTO Trade Facilitation Agreement is going to help reduce the shipping times by cutting red tape at the border, harmonizing customs procedures across the regions and just enabling quicker movement of goods across regions. Because for supply chains, that really is a critical aspect. And invest in the supply chains, unless you have that to attract the investment, it's going to be difficult. Uh, another thing is Caterpillar is currently providing training for South African suppliers. And this too is very important. You know, we so far we've trained employees from more than 40 prospective suppliers. And some of these have been integrated into Caterpillar's global supply chain. So a great success story. And our CAT Foundation 
since 2010 has invested $77 million in projects in Africa. And we're trying to invest in workforce readiness and STEM and vocational training, water resources management. So the whole thing to try to get more uh, critical mass of, of skilled workers in the continent. And uh, today, in fact, we, we uh, just invested, announced investment in South Africa through the South Africa Solidarity Fund. And this one is to support uh, COVID work. But um, just to summarize, Caterpillar, we, we definitely see an opportunity for Africa to capitalize on shifting supply chains post COVID-19. Uh, a key is the success for regional integration. It's absolutely essential. Mm -hmm. uh, and then making big strides with regard to trade facilitation. So these will strengthen the business climate and we think attract investors. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. That's a great summary of uh, not only uh, the, the, the business bottom line for um, uh, Caterpillar on the continent, but also some of the things that you're doing um, uh, in terms of doing good uh, as well, uh, a number of your um, CSR projects and others. So we thank you for sharing that. Um, let me see if, if, if Wankele is there. We have some questions that have come in. Um, yes, he's there. So uh, Wankele, um, how will, you know, lots of people want to know this. How will the AFCFTA uh, complement bilateral agreements uh, like FTAs, this um, uh, potential U.S.-Kenya FTA that everyone is excited about, uh, some are worried about, you know, how will this work with and support AFCFTA. And um, I thought you could um, uh, talk about that a bit before I turn back to um, uh, the chairman of uh, Ethiopian Airlines for some questions for him, please. Well, uh, thanks again, thanks again, Flory. Uh, let me just say uh, first, uh, uh, join you in saluting Ethiopian Airlines and my senior brother, uh, Gerbre Mariam, for keeping uh, um, the airline flying and keeping uh, uh, Africa connected. All of the personal protection equipment, the masks, the ventilators have been distributed across the continent by Ethiopian airlines at a very, very critical time. And so I think as an African, I want to appreciate uh, Ethiopian airlines for ensuring that we continue to have access to public health we continue to have access to the equipment that we need um, to fight the pandemic. And I also say on a personal note that when I am flying to New York in a week's time to visit my wife and my son from Addis Ababa, I will fly Ethiopian Airlines. Mm -hmm. So I want to, to thank uh, my senior brother. Um, we um, intend to build on all the progress that has been made in liberalization of trade in Africa. That is the objective. Um, the African continental free trade area must ensure that Africa um, moves, uh, uh, that we significantly improve intra-Africa trade from the 18% where it stands now to, to, to higher amounts um, over time. And as I said, that means that we must establish regional value chains. That means that we must uh, look to see how do we improve productive capacity in Africa. And you can take, you can take very, very uh, practical examples. Take the 14 core countries. You and I were trade negotiators before. Um, if we can find investors who will be willing to invest in Mali, in Burkina Faso, in productive capacity in cotton, so that these countries are able to move up the value chain. This is an example of what we mean by the AFCFTA enhancing uh, manufacturing capacity um, in Africa. Yesterday, the day before, I had a discussion with a global auto manufacturing company that, again, is looking to see how they can uh, uh, invest in productive capacity. And so we are building on all the progress that has already been made um, by regional economic communities, by individual countries, on AGOA. Um, the president of Ghana mentioned AGOA. Um, there are countries like Lesotho, for example, that because of AGOA have, able, have been able to employ over 300,000 people, uh, particularly women, 
in the area of textiles and clothing who export um, to the US, uh, particularly to Gap. So the point I make is this, the African continental free trade area is about market integration. It is about building on the progress that we have made. And so to the extent that, uh, as we heard from uh, President Kenyatta, that countries are saying, we, we want to go even further than the AFCFTA. The agreement enables that uh, to happen. And so um, I think that, that the complementarities are there between the AFCFTA and any other agreement that a particular country may wish to, to negotiate pursuant, pursuant to its own national development objectives and of course, in accordance with the rules that are set out in the agreement, the agreement makes it clear, you can negotiate as an FCFTA state party with whoever you want, you want to negotiate with, provided of course, you provide the same treatment uh, or even better to an AFCFTA state party um, uh, or, uh, based on reciprocity. So the point is, we want to build on the progress we're making. If Kenya and the US negotiate an agreement, we want to go even beyond that as the AFCFTA. If another country negotiates a, a third agreement with uh, um, an agreement with a third country, we will build on that and go even beyond that because what we want, productive investment to create jobs in Africa so that young Africans stop dying and being buried on the oceans of the Mediterranean we create jobs here in Africa. We, we expand and improve on our manufacturing capacity. We ensure that we have a coherent um, uh, market from a regulatory point of view so that investors are not subject to different sets of regulations. We want to enhance Africa's uh, uh, investor uh, uh, climate. And so I, I am very uh, uh, optimistic about um, the prospects that lie ahead. And um, as we build on the progress that has been made in regional economic communities, in bilateral investment uh, treaties, and in bilateral uh, uh, FTAs. Thank you, Wamkele. That's an excellent response to make it clear that uh, the AFCFTA and uh, bilateral FTAs are not mutually exclusive, but can actually support um, uh, African competitiveness, both uh, in products they ship to each other, as well mm -hmm. as to the rest of the world. Um, let me turn back to uh, uh, Mr. Gabramariam. Uh, and uh, I, I wanted to ask um, a question about um, how it's been possible. I, I, I too commend that uh, Ethiopian Airlines has been able to continue functioning and playing such a critical role in this time. Um, how has it been possible? What kinds of measures to put in place because we note that some of the other major uh, airlines on the continent have not been able um, to get uh, uh, um, become operational again. And so we just thought, you know, in terms of supporting uh, trade uh, and, and, and tourism uh, now, but then maybe if you could just uh, shift to how you see uh, sort of going forward, what will the role of uh, African um, airline carriers play in intra-African trade, um, and especially in bringing products back and forth between the continent and the US. We know you ship to other places as well, but we're, we're interested in how you get those products to the US, your cut flowers and uh, uh, value-added agricultural products and all that uh, is coming from the continent, automobiles and so forth. So sir, um, share with us a, a bit. You're on, you're on mute, sir. You're, you're on mute. <laughs> uh, yes. Thank Wonderful. you. Uh, very good question. Um, I think uh, the answer is uh, um, necessity is a mother of invention. <laughs> so it was, it, was, it was critically important and a matter of survival for us to seek means and ways to continue to fly. Uh, in the middle of this pandemic, because if you remember back in February, uh, we've been criticized, uh, I mean, in some sorts, that uh, when the rest of the world is not flying, well, 
It's not the rest of the world. Some, fly, some airlines stopped flights, some airlines continue. So we were among the uh, uh, airlines that continued. So um, again, uh, when most of the African countries closed their uh, borders for flight because of the uh, concern uh, of the spread of the virus, uh, and we found ourselves that 90% uh, or 95% of our passenger business was suspended overnight. So, uh, yeah. you know, right now we are among very few carriers in the world where we have not taken any bailout money. We have not taken any um, uh, short-term financing for uh, working capital. We have not laid off any single employee. We have not reduced any uh, salary of our employees. Uh, so thus far we are uh, carrying. So what we did was, um, number one, we, we wanted to continue flying as much as we can. Uh, and we knew that passenger business was gone. So we quickly diverted to cargo. And as you know, we are the largest cargo carrier. Uh, in, in fact, we are the largest airline in Africa by far but we are also the largest cargo carrier. And in the last 10 years, we have invested heavily in a cargo, uh, cargo airplanes, about 10 777, uh, Boeing 777, and two 737 uh, freighters. Um, we are uh, heavily Boeing uh, uh, airline, and uh, uh, this is a very long uh, relationship. Uh, so we have also invested uh, in the cargo terminal. So we have now the largest cargo terminal and the most modern in Addis. So we have used this investment to serve as a logistics hub for the continent. And right there, African countries, as uh, my, uh, my friend and uh, uh, colleague, uh, Mr. Uh, um, uh, mentioned before, uh, there was a need for urgent delivery of PPEs. Uh, Africa didn't know how to combat with this uh, pandemic, how to prepare itself. The health services, as we know, in Africa are underdeveloped. So uh, we played a very, very significant role in delivering these life-saving critical uh, medical supplies uh, from China mainly. Uh, by the way, it's not only to Africa. We were uh, among the largest carriers of PPE from China to Europe, to Spain, Portugal, France, Italy, UK, Germany, and so on, United States, Canada, Brazil, Argentina, and so on. So uh, the fact that we moved quickly to cargo has helped us a lot. But later on, we also found out that the cargo business, I mean, the, the demand of uh, PPE and medical supplies was beyond our capacity of uh, cargo airplanes. So we converted 25 passenger airplanes to cargo by removing their seats. Uh, we are still using them. And uh, uh, as a result of that, uh, Addis today is the, uh, the, the largest hub for WFP and the entire uh, United Nations humanitarian operation in Africa and uh, for uh, other uh, um, suppliers too. So, um, you know, we were able to move PPE from China for the Jack Ma Foundation uh, um, to 51 African countries in six days, in six wow. days. Yeah, so um, uh, it, was, it was important that we did this and uh, uh, we must have saved a lot of uh, lives in terms of preparation. So uh, this is how we handled it so far. But uh, you know, the industry in Africa is in a very, very bad shape, uh, African airline industry. So going out of COVID, there will be new opportunities, uh, also new challenges. Uh, the industry has uh, found itself in a completely different environment today. So uh, if you will, you know, it is like uh, um, security issues after the September 11, you know, uh, you and I were just going to the airport, board the plane in 30 minutes. We don't have to, uh, we didn't have to worry about security checks and so on before September 11. And 
now we we know what's going on uh, around the airport and uh, now biosecurity and biosafety is going to be a very very mm. uh, major issue for customers for airports for the traveling public so we are preparing ourselves to make sure that uh, we provide safe travel to the uh, traveling public and uh, we are already uh, we have already made changes uh, we have made uh, mask uh, wearing masks mandatory. Uh, we are disinfecting our airplanes on every departure, and we are disinfecting uh, airport facilities twice a day, and uh, uh, providing all the uh, sanitation uh, inside the airplane and also to our crew. So, uh, biosecurity is going to change the airline industry, and we are preparing accordingly. Thank you so much. I'm glad you brought up some of these. Uh, um, uh, newer issues too, because uh, post uh, COVID, we'll have to take many of these um, additional factors into account. Let me turn back to uh, uh, Vila, um, who uh, from Procter and Gamble. You know, Procter and Gamble, um, you were mentioning earlier, um, produces a lot of products on the continent. Uh, in various locations. Um, you, you, you're not one of the ones that are shipping back to the US under a Goa, but that's fine. You're, you're supplying the, this huge market on, on, on the continent. And I wondered if you could just share um, your thoughts on how companies like Procter & Gamble, both as an American company and then working with uh, uh, local African companies uh, can um, uh, scale up uh, production of products on the continent. You're in, I think, six locations. What, what are the ways that a company like Procter & Gamble can take advantage of the African continental free trade area, especially because you're focused on providing goods, producing goods and providing them uh, on the continent? And how can you bring in your, your, your African um, uh, counterparts, um, companies on the ground uh, mm -hmm. as a part of your value chain? Yep. Uh, well, for me, I would I would look into sort of again maybe a little bit shorter before before the January first, which I'm really looking forward to next January first, when hopefully we'll see the light to the African uh, Continental Free Trade Agreement. I think you know in the current situation, what is important from my perspective or our perspective as a company is is the situation in every country uh, is changing at lightning speed when it comes to new regulations, locking down, uh, unlocking. Um, and I think, you know, the, the, the dialogue between public and private sector when it comes to, you know, the countries or regions on being clear on and bringing more transparency about trade related policies and tra trade related changes which are influenced by COVID is, is something which can help short term. And every government is trying to figure this out. I think, you know, that, that's the effort where we need to continue working together as one uh, to, to enable trade and continue trading. And that second thing, which is again short term, is keep the supply chain flowing, especially for, you know, essential products. Okay. Mm. And, and, and we, we are operating across, across the continent. Okay. We have, uh, as you mentioned, few production capacities across the across the region. But for us, we also have you know offices or our distributor partners in almost every every country in the in the continent. So for us, you know, ensuring that we can deliver products today to consumers who need it uh, is very important. And we see you know a lot of barriers being built. And I'm very very happy that now I'm moving to something which is long term. I'm very happy to hear that. Uh, the AFCFTA continues to to work, and and it's it's only six months delay. Uh, that's a, that's a great news. Uh, with the pandemic, you know, the expectation was that a lot of countries will move to protectionism and will try to protect their own own investment, uh, which would not be the right thing uh, for continent. And I'm happy happy to hear that actually both of the excellencies, President. Akufuado, as well as President Kenyatta, have mentioned that they really want to strengthen the AFCFTA and, and accelerate it further, as well as Secretary General mentioning that there is a strict timeline. So I'm happy to see that. So for me, the AFCFTA will be the one thing which will help us, you know, an American company operating at the continent to, to grow further. Now, on the second part of your question on how can we work with the local SMEs. Now, 
If I go back, back, way back in time, actually, Procter and Gamble was SME when we started. Okay, it was two brothers-in-law, one producing candles, the other one producing soap, starting this small business, uh, which became now a global uh, corporation. And I think you know uh, one one big benefit of being big corporation, which I see, is is that legacy we can leave in the countries where we operate through developing the local local companies. And we have we have a lot of programs where we organize a supplier summits, uh, not only for our suppliers, but for people who mm. would like to be our supplier or supplier of any other similar corporation in the country, where we explain and 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 train them on what is it needed, what are the certain standards which companies like us would expect them. Uh, and we just had you know uh, a great partnership over the last six weeks with WeConnect in South Africa, where we've been working with 50 women-owned businesses, small, medium-owned uh, businesses in, in South Africa and working with those 50 women uh, and training them to, to be potentially one of our suppliers. And actually, I must say that, you know, a few of those businesses from the last year's class are actually already work, working to become one of our suppliers. So I think uh, we have... Uh, few programs uh, and it's it's maybe you know reach out to us in the country where you operate uh, our procurement is doing a regular research on on what is available in the local markets we want to work with the local companies uh, it's easier for us it's it's becoming more flexible for us to work with the local suppliers than have everything supplied from you know other part of the world so that's that's something that we're looking forward and i believe that afcfta will increase these opportunities even further because we will not only focus on the specific country where we operate, but we can source from the whole continent. Wonderful, wonderful, Vila. So let me turn back to Jeff Hardy. Uh, you, you, um, uh, Vila, you touched on something that we've seen with uh, Caterpillar uh, in terms of this thing of partnering with uh, local companies, because we know across Africa, local content and and um, uh, building up the capacity of local businesses has been important. Um, I know uh, Caterpillar, uh, at a number of our events, you've uh, had your one of your partners on the ground, Barlow World, uh, be uh, a, a part of a U.S. Africa Business Summit that we've done before. Um, uh, Jeff, tell us um, a, a little bit about how, as um, Africa is now um, going to be doing um, uh, this African continental free trade area, reducing barriers across uh, countries, um, and then the, 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 the prospects of a U.S.-Kenya uh, FTA. Um, how do you see Caterpillar as being able to continue what you do so well um, in terms of working with uh, partners on the ground and promoting um, uh, uh, those businesses as a part of what you do? Well, thank you, Flory. So let me just approach it this way. You know, digital technology, it was pervasive prior to COVID-19. Uh, we've seen a reliance on technology and connectivity soar um, even further during this crisis. And, and uh, some would say that it's advanced technology by 10 years, the use of technology by 10 years. Uh, we don't need to look any further than this very event. So, you know, we can still engage, we can still advance uh, with these discussions, we can still connect things to technology that rely on now more than ever. Um, and the other aspect of this is digital trade is becoming a new component of recent US trade agreements. And so we're very glad to learn that the digital trade component uh, commitments, you know, are, it's gonna be a focus in phase three of the USFCTA negotiations and striking the right balance between security, privacy, enabling policy environment that allows technology, e-commerce, connectivity to flourish. It's an important driver for all trade and investment going forward. And this is not just for technology companies. And you might wonder why is Caterpillar talking about that? Uh, well, Caterpillar is really interested in technology and digital technologies because we have the largest industrial fleet of connected assets in the world. We have over a million connected assets. So our dealers that are working with customers are providing them with machines that are connected. And so, they expect these digital services to, to uh, help them, and they do, make them more productive, more efficient, uh, safer, uh, less wasteful, and ultimately more successful. So 
from remote you know, monitoring and diagnostics to fully autonomous mining fleets that are operating in, in uh, Africa, Caterpillar equipment is more connected now than ever before. And restrictions on cross-border data flows, localization requirements for servers, SIM cards, um, and, and computing assets, that it stifles trade in many ways. And so we think this is a real opportunity for Africa trade policy post COVID-19. If we can get good digital policies in place in Africa that are more or less consistent across the continent, it will really be a huge advantage for Africa. You know, we see uh, digital trade popping up in the Middle East and the EU and Asia and other parts. And, and so Africa does have a, an opportunity to really stand out. And so if it can be addressed to the AFC FTA, that'd be great. And we know that USTR is going to focus on this during the bilateral negotiations with Kenya as well. And of course, we're hoping that once concluded, it paved the way for additional FTAs with, with African countries. So we see great opportunities. Digital technology is more than just IT companies. It's really all types of companies, an important component. And this is an opportunity for Africa to really uh, jump out ahead. Excellent. Thank you for that remark. We have just, just a little bit of time. I'm going to see if I can fit in uh, just two uh, quick uh, 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 questions here. Um, we have um, uh, Juan Kelly, um, some suggestions that are being made by Steve Lande of, the, uh, of uh, Manchester Trade about some key uh, benchmarks that um, AFCFTA could do. So, for example, um, um, will you announce a, a completion date for when you have a critical mass of, um, of um, ratifications? I know there are already at 29 countries, I think, 28 or 29. Um, another point is when, you know, completing the origin, uh, the rules of origin, um, when will that be done? Um, another one that's mentioned is uh, publishing on the internet um, the regulations and the tariff rates when they go into effect. And so, you know, we'll, we'll have more time uh, beyond this uh, panel today, um, but I wondered um, if you could just uh, touch on a couple of those, uh, just the idea of will you be announcing key benchmarks uh, for uh, the AFCFTA as they happen. And then I have to just say that, you know, I hope that you will look to CCA as a partner um, and our members like Manchester Trade and so many others, Procter & Gamble and Caterpillar and Ethiopian Airlines and uh, so many um, that are uh, participating today um, to allow us to help push the word out there that yeah. um, the AFCFTA has taken yet another step in um, actually implementing um, the AFCFTA. Just a brief uh, comment on this. Yes, thank you very much again, Flory. My, my, my dear friends, uh, uh, Steve, I, I owe him a phone call. Uh, I will call him back. Um, on rules of origin, yes, <clears throat> rules of origin outstanding. Uh, because of COVID-19, we, we couldn't progress on the rest of the package on market access, we couldn't progress because of COVID-19, but um, we have proposed a roadmap that will take us to conclusion of those, on those particular areas. Um, and, and I think that um, it's very, very important that as we lead up to the new trading date, that we conclude the work on rules of origin, mm -hmm. on market access and ratification. I'm very, very optimistic about ratification. I think that many, many countries in Africa, uh, look, 55 uh, countries, 54 signed the agreement. Mm -hmm. 28 countries have ratified in less than two years. Yeah. I don't think that we have seen, not only in the African Union, but nowhere in the world have we seen such rapid progress towards ratification. To me, this underscores the political commitment, the political will, to get this done. So post COVID-19, we will resume our work of getting uh, African countries to ratify whether we are talking about regional economic communities or individual countries. I would like to pick up on one or two points that uh, uh, Jeff made, which I think are absolutely critical. Digitization. Mm. Digitization, if Africa is to mount a formidable response, to the fourth industrial revolution, we must be prepared to answer questions around 3D printing. 
the internet of things, uh, uh, data mobility, the questions and the issues that Dimitrius mm -hmm. raised earlier. We've got to, we've got to confront these issues uh, because for me, they are directly linked to Africa's industrial development. Whether you're talking about digital industrial development or manufacturing, these questions around the fourth industrial revolutions are directly linked. And so when we talk about digitization, I'm not, I, in my mind, it's not only about e-commerce, it is digitization of trade in general. As my friend from UNECA, uh, David Luke always says, it is digitization of trade. And so I think as Africans, we've got to confront this uh, challenge. And I believe that unlike any other free trade agreement in the world, we actually have an opportunity. We have an opportunity to, to codify responses that are forward looking, that will take us beyond the fourth industrial revolution in terms of Africa's um, uh, preparedness for uh, uh, the fourth industrial revolution and the disruptions that, um, that it may bring. And so I, I, um, uh, uh, I want to assure everybody, I want to assure my fellow pan panelists that as the heads of state said, Africa remains committed um, as a matter of fact, Africa is willing to redouble efforts to implement this agreement. This is our recovery plan. This is our economic recovery plan year on year. We don't have $3 trillion to re-inject dynamism in our economy. The dynamism in our, in our economy will be re-injected by boosting intra-Africa trade significantly beyond 18%. And that's about, uh, that's what this uh, uh, African continental free trade area is all about, including, by the way, including the single African air tra uh, traffic market. Because if we are not, if we cannot have interconnectivity in Africa, if we cannot have airlines uh, able to, to facilitate trade in Africa, um, we're not going to achieve our objectives. And so this protocol, the single uh, African air transport market that was signed in uh, 2018, facilitates greater liberalization in air traffic services. And so I am, I am uh, very optimistic about a post COVID-19 um, Africa and about the recovery of Africa post uh, COVID-19. Thank you. I'm gonna take that Wankele as your uh, message to us, your, your final message to us uh, uh, on the importance of uh, trade, uh, both intra-African trade and Africa's trade with the US um, and how it will impact um, uh, a resilient post COVID recovery. Um, thank you very much. Let me turn to each of the other three panelists for just a final word. I was gonna ask uh, Mr. Gabor Mariam the question that had come in about the single African air transport market, but we don't have time for that. And Juan Kelly, you've really touched on it. Let me just ask uh, Mr. Gabor Mariam, um, uh, Mr. Triska and Mr. Hardy, just a, a, a minute each. What is your sort of final um, uh, a message that you would like to get out about um, uh, a trade on the continent and trade uh, in the US and uh, um, how you think that we can support it and uh, contribute to a more resilient Africa and a more robust US-Africa trade uh, relationship. Uh, Mr. Gabor Merriam, uh, you're on mute. <laughs> you're on mute, sir. Uh, thank you, Flori. Uh, I think uh, in my perspective, um, um, what Mr. Wamkele is uh, leading uh, CFTA, the SFCFTA is very important. We have to work on that and we have to be all committed towards its success, governments, uh, companies, and uh, the entire society because it makes us stronger as a block. And also it gives a very good opportunity for uh, uh, partners like the U.S. because most of the U.S. companies, as you know, Flory, they find the African market so fragmented, small and fragmented, and uh, 
you know, it's very difficult to invest in this country or that country because that country by itself, the market size is very small and economies of scale uh, comes to question. So when we put our resources together, we, uh, we, we uh, interact or trade with uh, uh, our partners as a block like the European Union, then we get stronger and uh, it will also be good uh, opportunity for our uh, partners like the US. Uh, and uh, along with that, I think we have to uh, work on logistics. Logistics is a very, very important. Mm. Air freight, air freight uh, surface transport within the, the, the continent, these are very, very important. If we are going to move people around, if we are going to move goods around, uh, and uh, capital around, uh, services around, then we need logistics. So, uh, yeah, so I think uh, uh, my message to African governments uh, who are um, hearing us here in the forum or elsewhere, uh, important attention to aviation because aviation is uh, a value creator, uh, an important uh, economic engine for uh, economic development, social economic development, but attention is lacking in Africa. Aviation is not getting the attention it deserves because with a, a three or four kilometers of a runway, a country can connect with the rest of the world. But yes. unfortunately that is missing. So thank, thank you, you sir. Thank you so much. Those are important final words on the importance of uh, aviation as a critical sector uh, of Velo. Yes. Yes, uh, so let me try to be quick. Uh, I think, you know, uh, you know the, the young continent uh, with the huge youth population in uh, strategically located in the middle of the shipping lanes between Europe, Asia, and, and uh, both Americas uh, is, is greatly positioned for future success. And I think, you know, we, we all need to work together to create resilient Africa. I think uh, as I said, we need to avoid temptations of protectionism. Uh, as we go through the COVID crisis, we will need to focus on protecting lives as well as preserving economies. And hopefully with the AFCFTA, uh, we're gonna create a lot of opportunities for future growth. I, I, I agree um, uh, with Mr. Tevoda that uh, there needs to be further investment into infrastructure and creation of of infrastructure, not only the air infrastructure, but I think also the physical infrastructure to improve intra-Africa navigation. And I can say that uh, probably for the whole private sector, we stand ready to work with the government uh, to not just identify, but also deliver and execute on those opportunities going forward. Excellent, thank you so much, Vilo. Jeff, uh, last minute, uh, your message to us on, on trade uh, within Africa and with the US. Okay, thank you very much. Well. Caterpillar is so focused on helping our customers build a better world. Infrastructure is really a foundation for growth and Africa needs infrastructure, has so many opportunities for it. Trade is critical to provide the needs and, and means to build that infrastructure. Trade agreements are critical to set the rules and regulations and really open up access to markets. So the AFC FTA is going to be very important for driving intracontinental trade the U.S.-Kenya bilateral trade agreement is hopefully going to open doors for other agreements as well. If it's really negotiated well, we see great opportunities. Digital, I want to emphasize, is important, but um, we're very optimistic that there's going to be uh, good, good movement in trade policy because it looks like African leaders are so committed to wanting to do the right thing and really focus on development of the continent, and we're there to help support that. Thank you so much, Jeff. Thank you to all the panelists for this excellent discussion on trade and uh, building a resilient uh, US-Africa post-COVID uh, relationship, using trade as an engine for economic growth, uh, both uh, on the continent and uh, here in the US as well. Uh, let me make some uh, closing remarks for the forum as a whole, our entire four days. Um, I, I'm delighted to note that we had over 2,500 registered participants for the CCA Leaders Forum. Um, we also live streamed on over 300 Africa-related news sites, and it attracted well over 100,000 views daily. 
we're very excited about that. What a wonderful high note to end on uh, for our four day leaders forum. A special thanks to His Excellency Uhuru Kenyatta, President of Kenya, and His Excellency Nana Kufo Adu, President of Ghana, for honoring us uh, with their participation today. I also want to say thank you to President Paul Kagame of Rwanda and President Felipe Nyusi of Mozambique, who joined us earlier during our Leaders Forum. Uh, thanks again um, to all of you who have participated. Now, only six months ago, we were on track for a very different June. CCA was busy planning for our 13th US Africa Business Forum in Marrakesh, Morocco, scheduled for earlier this month. The government of Morocco could not have been a more gracious and enthusiastic partner. And we had tremendous support from within the private sectors and governments in the United States and Africa as well as from the US Embassy in Rabat and the Consulate in Casablanca. I'm grateful to these stakeholders and partners and assure you and everyone, all our listeners that are participating in the forum today, that we are determined to reschedule the Morocco summit as soon as it is safe to do so. In an astonishingly short period of time, COVID-19 has changed our lives and our world. Africa has gone from growth projection, projections higher than the global average at the start of 2020 to facing its first recession in 25 years. This month alone, COVID-19 cases on the continent have doubled. Thankfully, COVID-related mortality on the continent has not been as bad as in other parts of the world or as some predicted. We can all hope that it stays just that way. CCA's Leaders Forum has been our way to provide a high level platform when it is most critical that US and African government and private sector leaders collaborate, not only to fight COVID-19, but to strategize to ensure Africa's economic recovery and to drive resilient US Africa business engagement post COVID. Throughout the four days of our Leaders Forum, we have explored the theme of resiliency in the face of an unprecedented pandemic. On Tuesday, we had the honor of hosting His Excellency Paul Kagame, President of Rwanda, and an outstanding panel that discussed different ways Africa can harness the financial resources needed to create fiscal space to effectively combat and recover from COVID-19. This included a lively debate about the role of debt service suspension, on Wednesday, and we hosted His Excellency Felipe Nyusi, President of Mozambique, and a dynamic panel that day that explored economic and health innovations in fighting the pandemic. And then yesterday, on Thursday, the panel looked at the drivers of growth in post-COVID-19 Africa. USAID Deputy Administrator Bonnie Glick highlighted the US government's role in helping to create the conditions for this new future. And today we had an excellent trade discussion and we're honored again to hear from the presidents of Kenya and Ghana. So here are some of my takeaways quickly from the week. First, like the rest of the world, Africa is in the midst of an unprecedented health and economic crisis, which may still be in an early stage. Second, that said, Africa has an impressive story to tell of resiliency and leadership. Many governments have responded quickly and decisively. The four presidents who joined our leaders forum told of how they have made the difficult balance between lives and livelihoods to keep their economies moving forward while mitigating the pandemic's effects. And they've done so with significant success. Third, the African Continental Free Trade Agreement is more important than ever. The AFCFTA should help attract investment, promote intra-African trade and manufacturing, and increase Africa's position in regional and global value chains that should build wealth and help post-pandemic recovery. The African Union's creation of a single African platform to procure health-related products internationally is a good example of new joint action on the part of Africa. The African Union envoys, two of whom joined us this week, 
are proving effective at building support for continent-wide solutions. Partnerships are now more important than ever. Multilateral institutions are providing critical financial and technical support. Bilateral partners have stepped up, including, of course, the United States, even as we grapple with our own COVID crisis. New initiatives and institutions such as Prosper Africa, the US Development Finance Corporation, and the US-Kenya Free Trade Agreement talks lay a strong foundation for US-Africa partnership. Africa is not looking for handouts, but for long-term partners that will enable it to create the fiscal space needed to get back to its path of growth. Six, the private sector has a critical role to play. U.S. and African businesses are adapting and finding new sources of resiliency. The digital economy has emerged as even more critical. Companies and institutions have adopted new innovative financing strategies. African companies are producing their own PPE and testing kits. They are looking at ways to become more self-sufficient in the production of pharmaceuticals and manufacturing in general while increasing their participation in global value chains. And last, post-COVID Africa, like in the rest of the world, will likely lead to new priorities and new opportunities. We should expect to see a greater emphasis on the healthcare and digital sectors. We may also see a greater focus on improving business climates, efforts to ensure that Africa's precious resources are not wasted through corruption, and new public-private partnerships needed to help economies get back on their feet and promote inclusive growth. As one of our speakers said this week, this is a period when we need to reimagine society. I hope that the Leaders Forum has helped you understand this new world we are in and to discover these new opportunities. I have learned a great deal myself and come out more hopeful about a post-COVID Africa that is more resilient, and even more open to the opportunity for US-Africa engagement that benefits African and American businesses, people, and our countries. Once again, many thanks for joining us this week, and a special thanks to our generous sponsors and media partners. Thanks to all our panelists over the last four days, you have given us so much to think about. We appreciate all the great work you are doing in these trying times, and I absolutely must say, in terms of my CCA team, thank you, each of you, for your work that you have done behind the scenes, working so hard to make sure that we did a great job on this forum and in putting this whole event together. Thank you so much. Uh, I so appreciate each and every one of you. To all our attendees, we are deeply grateful for your support to Corporate Council on Africa. Please call on us if we can be helpful as you move forward. We look forward to having you join us in July for our next webinar series entitled Blended Finance, Catalyst for Africa's Post-COVID-19 Economic Recovery. In the meantime, please stay safe, stay well, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you.